He who gives food to all flesh, for the steadfast love endures forever. You're getting ready for Thanksgiving. You're going to know about food to the flesh on Thursday. You're getting your fatty McButter pants out and ready to roll. You know you are. Excited about family, friends, and of course, celebrating God's blessing around a full meal. You know, there are many passages of Scripture that that talk about a meal. Talk about how God blesses us with a meal. And certainly when we think of the first century, we realize how important hospitality was, how important a meal was. It was not just a social experience, it was also a spiritual experience. And I always thought that it was interesting in the 23rd Psalm that it was so real. It's a a real psalm. Now this is a, a psalm that many of you know, a precious psalm of David about our shepherd, right? And we, 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 we uh, are encouraged by how it starts out. The Lord is my shepherd. What? I shall not want. He leadeth me into green pastures. He, he actually makes me lie down in them, right? He leads me to still waters. He restores my soul. He, he makes me righteous for his name's sake. In other words, it's not because we're good that we're righteous. It's, it's because of his name's sake that, that we become righteous. And, and so all of that I'm a fan of. I'm like, yes, <laughs> restore me, lead me, feed me, nice calm waters. I'll take it. This is great. But then, but then he goes a different direction, doesn't he? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I always thought that that part of the verse, I would have loved to have changed. I would have loved for it to say that, that you prepared a, a table with, with your presence, Lord, and your presence only, or with you and the angels, or with you and my besties. But he says that he prepares a table in the presence of my enemies. Isn't that odd? Why? Why? First of all, what does God mean when he says that he prepares a table for us? It means that that all of us are going to be able to experience, if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, a table. And in an Old Testament mind, when they're talking about the presence of God, they're probably thinking in the tabernacle of the table of presence, which is actually an opportunity for them to dwell with God, get closer to God. Now, as the church, we realize that because of Jesus shed blood, that not only do we have to experience it through a tabernacle and through a priest, but we get to experience the table of God's presence in a relationship. It's not just about um, what God gives us, but it's the fact of the matter, not what's on the table, but who sits at the table with us. And so we are able to enjoy the fellowship, the relational fellowship with God, enjoying his blessings for us. We sit down and and, and God says, I want to refresh you, Brian. He pours me a glass of encouraging water. Brian, I have provided for you. And he begins to minister to me. We pray and talk together. Enjoy experiencing fellowship with one another. But he says that he prepares the table in the presence of our enemies. That means that there is bound to be distractions. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us that the evil one walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And one of the things that he will do is, I thought I could steal one of these stools. (laughs) is he comes up and he says, hey, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. 
How's it going? Yeah. How's your, how's your relationship with your husband? Huh? How's that? He talks with his mouth full, by the way. <laughs> Nag, right? It's always your fault. Everything's always your fault. Not their fault. It's, it, it's always about you. You can't do anything right. How many years? 15 years. You think that's going to change? No. Why do you put up with it? I mean, you are a saint. How do you handle her? I don't know. Don't know how you do it. Hey, you know, Steve, watch your back, bro. Yep. I seen him talking over there at work about you. Yeah. That promotion, you can forget it if you're hanging out with that guy. Here's a problem. Yep. Do you see how quickly the evil one comes, sits down at our table, starts to get us thinking a different way? You know, poor you. You don't have the Apple toilet yet? Why not? It's amazing. It's a device everyone needs. It's not here yet. It's coming. <laughs> you know, you should, you should go ahead and spend the money and get that. You really drag them behind. Doesn't matter if you have to go in debt. Just go for it. We have an opportunity to sit, to consider, and that's what the psalmist did in the song that we just repeated. And be reminded about the fact that the steadfast love of our God endures forever. And I want to warn you of something. There will always be the desire for the evil one to come in and try to have a seat at your table. Try to, try to have a different voice that comes into your life. What might be some of the tactics, some of the voices that he might use to kind of come and take what should be a table of thanksgiving, a table of God's blessing, but instead reroute it, change that table? First of all, if you ever hear this, things would be better at another table. This, this table isn't going to completely satisfy you. This table is not going to meet the needs that you really have. There, there's another table over here that I think that you need to move to. There's another opportunity over here that I think you need to explore. Why don't you walk away from God's love and God's truth? The fact that God has given you the, the descriptions on how you can find a life. And, and what does the good shepherd do? He, he gives us an abundant life. What does the thief want to do? Well, he wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. John 10. But he doesn't come at you. He does not come at you in a way that you would think. He, he does not walk up and, he, and, and he's not like, hey, why are you satisfied with this? Ha, 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 ha. I'm scaring myself right now. I don't, I don't even know. Put that down. Right? He, you know what he comes as? Exactly what you're looking for. You know what he says? Exactly what you want to hear at that moment. And so he comes and he sits down and he gives you a very rational thought. It started in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? God's blessing for Adam and Eve, unparalleled. Perfect world, perfect universe, perfect relationship. Everything was perfect. Everything was good. And God said, I get to sit down and have communion with you every night. We walk together. We talk together. We eat together. We enjoy all of this. And in comes Satan and he says, hey, is this all you get to enjoy? <laughs> what about that other tree? Yeah, God, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't really have your best at heart. He doesn't want you to become more like him. 
He wants to be the big show. And from then on, there's been someone that wants to come into the relationship that we have with the Lord, a relationship that we should be recognizing God's blessing, God's love, God's direction, and interject another conversation. What, what might that sound like? Well, as we mentioned, one would be, this isn't enough. You know, your, your wife, don't, don't stay with her. This girl's paying you some attention. This situation, you have a right to be bitter about it. Go ahead, dig in. Oh, yeah, get angrier. You deserve to be angry. Make it hard on them. They need to pay. Someone's got to pay. And and your expectations weren't met, so you should punish them and punish them good. Let me tell you another word that the the evil one is going to say to us. He's going to say, hey, you know what? Um, you're not enough. You're not enough. You're not pretty enough. Not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not spiritual enough. You're not enough. Kind of a wreck, actually. I know you're worried about it. I know you don't think you measure up. I know you think your whole life is behind the eight ball. You're not enough. Nope. Never will be. Here's the, here's the hard part about that. There's a vein of truth to it. After the fall, we're not enough. We're broken. And, and even when we consider our best selves and look at our real lives, we say, man, there's, there's improvement that has to be made. There, there are steps I have to take. And he wants to distract you from the very, very powerful truth that says the good shepherd has what? Laid down his life for his sheep. Why? Because you're not enough. But in him you have been made enough. The righteousness of of Christ, when you accept him as your Lord and Savior, has been imputed to you, and you measure up because Christ has measured up. Because the one who walked this earth and was enough, never sinned, never failed, never walked away from God's law or God's presence, successfully died on the cross, rose again, and he said, I died for you so that you can be enough. Are you God's child today? You're enough. How does God see you today? As his son and daughter, not as some kind of a messed up, jacked up individual. He sees you as someone that he loves, as he loves his very own son, Jesus Christ. And he just wants to commune with you. And he wants to remind you, I have had my body broken for you. I've had my blood spilled for you. I've imputed the perfect righteousness of my life to you so that you can know you're enough. And that will not give you pride, but your glory will go to what? The cross. The glory will go to Christ who deserves it because he is enough and he has made you enough and me enough. Amen? If you hear anything different, that is not from your God. It's not. Listen, this is the most expensive reservation at this table there could ever be. Jesus Christ made a reservation for you to have eternal life, and he went to a cross to pay the bill. So that when you get to sit down and have fellowship with him, the bill's not coming later. It's already been paid for. And it's made you enough. Praise God. If you ever hear the idea that someone's out to get you, Oh, yeah. They're, they're going to stab you in the back. They're out to get you. You see, one of the things that Satan does not want is the body of Christ to be unified, the bride of Christ to be beautiful. 
He, and, and, and because of this world, and it's a hard world, we, we, we tend to take a defensive posture. We tend to go through life kind of with our hands up, our dukes up. And, and here we are having a table in the presence of our enemies. And so we're walking along and we're like, I don't know if I can trust so-and-so. You know, I'm going, going through life and kind of going, man, this guy, he was sleeping in my message last week. He's one of our deacons. <laughs> maybe I'm terrible. Maybe, maybe I put everybody to sleep. Maybe, maybe man, I, ca- I can't believe this. Oh, yeah. There's Mrs. Email. Yep. And, and, and this one over here, he has so many gifts. I, I, honestly, in my heart of hearts, he could probably lead this church better than I can. I mean, why, why am I even doing this? Am I even capable? Do I even have the ability to do this? I mean, I'm going to watch out for these people. Listen. Our body can be unified and whole because Christ's body was broken for us. When you consider the church, the church should be a loaf that is not tore apart because Jesus allowed his body to be tore apart so that there could be unity. Because at our core, who we really are and our identity is in Christ. And so that means whatever background you come from, whatever economic background, whatever culture you come from, whatever situation you're in, when we sit down, when we sit here, when we lift our voices and sing and praise God, we are all on the same page. Why? Because Christ is our core, our center, our identity. And so that commonality, well, it covers all our idiosyncrasies and differences. Because at our core, we are unified in Christ. So when you see your Thanksgiving table loaded with turkey and all the fixings, remember his steadfast love endures forever. And his blessings are there for you. And you know what? Defend your table, brothers and sisters. <laughs> he may be able to walk around like a pr- prowling lion, but he does not get a seat at our table. I'd like to read a passage of scripture that talks about the bread of life in John 6, 47 through 49, it says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of the bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, when Jesus began to give this discussion, it was right after he broke the bread and fed the 5,000. And people were following him in the droves. And the reason they were following him in the droves is because they thought this is a God that's just going to meet every single physical need we have. And Jesus wanted them to understand that, that just as he told the devil when the devil tempted him, man doesn't live by physical bread alone, right? There's a spiritual bread that we need, and that bread is Christ himself. And we now have the decoder ring of the cross and we understand the Lord's table so that we understand when Jesus said something very, very strong that caused a lot of the crowd to leave, which is, I am the bread of life. And unless you eat this bread and drink this blood, You cannot have eternal life. 
And a lot of the so-called disciples who weren't fully in with the message of Christ looked at that and said, I'm out. But today, the cross makes that statement make a lot of sense. And it makes sense in what we're about to do right now. And I'll invite the men that are going to pass out the elements to come on down and prepare for communion. I'll ask Jeff Raymond to pray as we considered the fact that God took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you.